In this video, I want to talk a little about the background behind research ethics. So we've got these different uh, ethics codes that list principles for how to treat uh, human participants in your research. But I think if, if you're made to read these for a class, they can, they can seem a little bit dry, kind of abstract, and uh, it, we lose sight of why they were developed to begin with. And in every case, we've developed these various different codes of ethics because of a similar scenario. So we have some, some people who are claiming to be doing research, and in the name of that research, they are hurting other people. They're, maybe they're getting real scientific knowledge. They're doing good science uh, other than the fact that they're hurting people. Or maybe they're doing stuff that is just hurting people and not even giving good science, depending on, on the case. But in any case, they have done the things that did not consider the well-being of their participants. And we, sh we really shouldn't even call them participants in some cases because they were forced to, uh, to engage in this research. And in each case... Eventually, some other people have come along and seen this and, and decided that we as human beings do not want to be hurting others in the course of our, of our research, um, especially in, in some of the completely unnecessary ways that have been done through history. And so these people have developed these various different codes of ethics, listing principles for how we should treat people if we want to avoid uh, hurting them as much as we can while still uh, advancing our scientific knowledge. So to give you some concrete examples, the classic, uh, most horrific example of people hurting others in the name of science is definitely the Nazi medical experiments. I won't go into too much detail here, uh, but these were really vicious, nasty things. This is, like I said, where uh, the Nazi doctors completely dehumanized the people. Uh, again, I won't even call them participants because saying participant it, it sort of implies a, a voluntary aspect to things. And these people were uh, forced to take place in this research. They were Really, we shouldn't even call it research in many cases. Sometimes it led to real data about the human body. Uh, many times it really is better classified as torture than research. And uh, in many cases it, and it, it led to the death of the people the research was being done on. I mean, they would do things like uh, break a bone and then let it heal and then re-break it repeatedly to see how, just to see how the body would respond to having the same bone broken and rebroken. Um, in many cases, there wasn't even a good rationale for why a particular type of research should be done um, because they were, they were so dehumanizing these people that it seemed like even, even in something they were curious about, well, might as well, might as well try it even if it, if it is horribly torturous and lethal to the people we are experimenting on. Uh, so, so there were the Nazi medical experiments. Um, there were, I don't want to give you the impression that this was only something that happened a long time ago in a country far away. Uh, in the U.S., uh, in uh, 1932, the U.S. government started, started a study called the Tuskegee... Uh, ex well, it's, now it's called the Tuskegee Experiment or the Tuskegee Syphilis Experiment... What they wanted to do was they wanted to uh, study people with syphilis to see the progression of the disease over time. At the time there was no that they started this, there was no known cure for syphilis. Uh, but so in the beginning, the it doesn't seem uh, quite so ethically questionable. But they did some things that were borderline. They uh, the main thing they did was they did not uh, tell the participants that they brought in uh, who were people who, who had syphilis. They found p people who had syphilis, uh, and they had them, uh, you know, they, they offered them uh, free health care, uh, but they never really told them exactly what it is that they were being treated for. Uh, they, they told them some a, a vague term. They said, you're being treated for bad blood, but they did not tell them they had syphilis. You maybe could make some rationale, for that being acceptable since if there was no cure for the syphilis. But 
Uh, eventually, they did develop, there was a cure developed, penicillin, the antibiotic penicillin came along and was proven, was shown uh, by others, by other researchers, to be an effective treatment for syphilis. Even at that point, the uh, researchers in the Tuskegee experiment did not inform the participants that they had syphilis, uh, and they did not treat them. And they allowed the syphilis to progress for decades until 1972 when it was finally shut down. And this was conducted by our own public health service, which is, which is the primary division of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So this is something that happened in our own government. It's not like our entire government knew about it and conspired to hurt the American people, but, but it was a, a, an official government-funded study that happened in our own country. Uh, at a much less severe level, we have, and, and more closely related to psychology and research uh, in, the, in the behavioral sciences, we have uh, studies like the, like the Milgram study of obedience, which if you're not familiar with it, basically Milgram had participants come in. He wanted to study uh, obedience in, in, in somewhat uh, weird connection. He wanted to, to better understand why some of the Nazi uh, soldiers and Nazi officials had had done what they were told. They had said they were just following orders, and he was trying to investigate that. Uh, so it's kind of interesting that uh, that he was act he was really trying to do good. And uh, there's a there's a very strong argument that he gave very useful information, and didn't do uh, much of anything harmful to his participants. But then there's others who will argue that he did. So anyway, to, to give you a little background, in case you are not familiar with the Milgram study, uh, basically he wanted to understand if he could tell someone. Uh, to shock another person to the point that, he, that they thought they were killing them, uh, the other person, but would still continue to administer electric shocks until uh, the other person was dead. Now, in reality, they were not delivering real electric shocks. The other person was not being harmed. Nobody died in the study. But the participants, in many cases, uh, were uh, obedient, did follow through, believed they had hurt or possibly killed another human being. And so, and there are other uh, similar uh, studies where there was a lot of deception involved, where the participants were misled in terms of being told the study. Uh, so, for example, Milgram told this, the participants that, that he was studying uh, memory and learning and deceived them so that he would be able to, to test this idea that they would be highly obedient. Um, so and may, there are a number of different examples of psychological experiments similar to that that have been done over time uh, where there's a debate about whether the participants may have suffered uh, significant psychological harm, uh, emotional or mental uh, trauma of some kind as a result of the, the study they participated in and that they didn't uh, have any idea that they were signing up for that kind of a thing when they went into it. Uh, so a lot of questions about the whether that is an ethical thing. And so so we could go on all day talking about these different examples, but the point is that there were a lot of uh, various, uh, through time, a lot of different people doing research in questionable ways, uh, spanning from, from Milgram, where it's very debatable, to something that, uh, that is outright horrific, like the Nazi medical experiments. And we responded to this by creating various uh, ethical codes. So uh, one that came directly out of the Nazi medical experiments is called the, the Nuremberg Code. I'm going to just give you list the, the, some of the most common ones that you will see coming up over and over again. Um, the Nuremberg Code, it's called the Nuremberg Code uh, because it was developed uh, uh, as part of... Uh, trials that took place in Nuremberg, Nuremberg, Germany, uh, right after World War II. So after World War II, uh, many of the Nazi officials, and in this case Nazi doctors, were tried, uh, were put on trial in Nuremberg. And uh, the Nuremberg Code was developed in terms of how can we move forward from this to try to make sure this kind of thing doesn't happen again. Um, the Tuskegee experiment and and other research like this uh, was uh, was led to the development of something called the the Belmont the Belmont Report, 
which in many ways is very similar to the Nuremberg Code, you'll find that a lot of these codes, they borrowed from those that came before them. They maybe added or developed or changed things, but a lot of them have uh, certain core principles in common uh, that we'll talk about later on. Uh, and then uh, the uh, separately the APA, and this didn't come out specifically of the Milgram study, but the Milgram study and uh, and 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 the Nazi ex medical experiments and the Tuskegee experiment and many different psychological experiments were were raising these concerns. And so while the the Belmont report was being developed on the one hand, uh, independently the the American Psychological Association, the APA, was developing its own ethics code. And so, at least in this class, these are the three that you will run into, uh, the Nuremberg Code, the Belmont Report, and the APA Ethics Code. Uh, I don't recommend trying to memorize all of the principles in these, but being familiar with where they come from and what are some of the most important core philosophies that underlie all of these codes is an important, excuse me, a very important, I would say vital part of uh, being a, a researcher who treats, uh, you, you know, that you treat your participants in, in a way that uh, minimizes the harm that they suffer and, and maximizes um, the benefits of your research. Now, these ethics codes don't uh, in and of themselves have uh, legal weight, but they've been used as the basis for the development of various different laws. So we have a number of different federal laws and regulations, oops, regulations, um, and, and in particular, uh, one of the things you'll see in your research methods class is that uh, these laws and regulations led to the requirement for uh, what are called institutional review boards which are abbreviated IRBs, oops, IRBs. And the point of an institutional review board is basically what the, what the federal government says is that if you're a university doing research and you're or anywhere doing research and getting funded uh, by the government, you uh, absolutely must have a, basically a committee uh, that will look over your research proposal before you even start doing research. Uh, just to look over your proposal to see if they believe it is ethical to to if they believe any potential risks or costs uh, or, or 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 potential for harm to your participants if they believe that is uh, justified. Um, so uh, at any university, any college that you go to where you might have a chance to participate in research with human participants in particular, you're going to have uh, an institutional review board that would look over your research. Um, if you're wondering, by the way, about, uh, about research with non-human subjects, uh, there's a separate uh, sort of review board uh, for that, which I won't talk about here, but, there, but that is uh, also a thing that, that exists to oversee uh, non-human research. Um, but hopefully that gives you a little background in terms of where these things came from. And, uh, and next we'll get into talking about some, what, what are some of the uh, most important core principles uh, that you need to make sure to understand right away that, that are common to all these things, the, the Nuremberg Code, the Belmont Report, and the APA Ethics Code.